You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R.com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit ftserussell.com, cboe.com, and cmegroup.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means it is Thursday. It is 1.30 p.m. Central, 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Do you know what's going on in the world of futures options? Well, let's find out together. It is time for TWIFO this week in futures options. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-evolving Options Insider Radio Network, pleased to see so many of you are enjoying the plus and the pro journeys that are going on out there. If you don't know what I'm talking about, check it out, theoptionsider.com, slash plus or slash pro, slash shop. We'll kind of show you both of them side by side so you can compare and contrast. That way, if you prefer getting your stuff old-fashioned way on demand on your podcast provider of choice, it's all still there for you as well. So now there are more ways than ever for you folks to engage with and enjoy the content. If you like your stuff live in your ear holes right away, don't want to wait for the podcast. We got plus for you. If you want even more, you want to go above and beyond, you want extra shows, had another great cute pro Q&A this week, options, oddities, all sorts of other fun stuff. Then the pro is for you. Either way, we want to hear from all you folks out there as well. So keep hitting us up those questions, those comments. We do love to hear from all of you guys and gals out there. Let's see who we're hearing from on the old program today. I'm pleased to be joined once again by our old friend, Mr. Russell Rhodes, a.k.a. the once and future Dr. Bix, a.k.a. the guy holding down the badge for derivatives research over there at EQ Derivatives, also moonlighting over there as a professore at the Kelly School of Business. Mr. Rhodes, welcome back to the program, sir. Always happy to be here. How am I am I hurting your earballs with my new microphone? No, it sounds good. It's like Perfect. you're right next, it's like you're right next to me in the studio, sir. I like this. 
Yeah, well, I'm, I'm happy that everything is working and I'm ready to talk about, I'm pretty excited to talk about options on futures today. I think we should do it. Speaking of which, I do believe, I think you might have been our last in-person guest in the studio before we shut it all down for the pandemic, oh. sir. So you have that one distinction you can hang on your resume there. That should be on your LinkedIn profile forthwith, sir. Should I be the first one when you have somebody back in? Yeah, who knows when we're doing that, but when that happens, sure. Why not? Mr. Rhodes. Wow. I could have done it today. We've we've got to coordinate better. (laughs) Mr. Rhodes can be perhaps the first of many as we head right on into the Movers and Shakers report. It's time to find out what's rallying on the light side and falling to the dark side at CME Group this week. It's time for the Movers and Shakers report. All right, everybody, welcome to the Movers and the Shakers, the portion of the show where we break down what the heck has been moving to the upside and to the downside over the past week across the broad spectrum of stuff that they trade at CME Group. It's pretty much a little bit of everything over there. So pick your poison, Mr. Rhodes. Where should we begin our journey this week, to the light side or to the dark side, sir? Uh, let's go to the light side, but that's not a precursor to my answer for the next for for where we go after all of that oh interesting 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 indeed to the light side we go we got kind of a nice even mix of light side and dark side this week if you want to see this chart for yourselves cme usually tweets it out right before showtime give them a follow over there if you want to keep an eye on that we also send it out there as well so you could access this report for yourselves if you don't have access to the premium version of the quick side if you did so you'd see it again pretty evenly split this week for the most part let's go to the light side first it's kind of dominated in both directions by two complexes listeners i'll let you guess which ones those are as we start to the light side number five the 30 year up about two and a quarter percent this week number four lean hogs it's a little livestock sneaking in there up 2.28 percent it was number three in the same direction last week, up nearly 8%, 7.92%. Percent. So interesting couple of weeks for the hashtag hog love. Number three, palladium. Little metals breaking in there, up 2.8%. Then we're back to the rates, listeners. Number two, the ultra bond, up 3.3%. And number one, the big dog, euro dollars, up almost 13%, 12.96%. So a robust week for the rates. You know what is not a robust week for, listeners? was ags actually let's go to before we get to ags number six just just barely missing the top or should say the bottom five this week is our old friend the russell 2000 off 4.4 percent then we get into our actual dark side our actual bottom five (laughs) out there it's rough rice another rough week for rough rice yes that joke never gets old listeners off 4.64 percent number four is wheat off 6.15 percent Number three, KC wheat, the other flavor, six and about a half percent. It was number four in the other direction last week, up nearly 7.6 percent. Numero dos soybean meal off 6.71 percent. It was our number one winner, winner chicken dinner to the upside last week, listeners, up nearly 11 percent. And it does some decent paper, nearly 60,000 contracts on the tape. And number one to the dark side this week, the big dog in the ag space, it's corn off 10.11 percent. It was number two in the opposite direction last week, up 9.53%. So corn having, and all the ags having a rock'em, sock'em robots week. Mr. Rhodes, I am now about to surprise you. Because normally, normally I would say to you, where do you want to start your journey? And this is the point of the show where you say, I want to go to rates because you want to start in rates. But you know, I'm not even going to ask you. Instead, I am going to choose where we go first this week. And guess what I'm going to pick? You will never guess. Yes, we're going to start in the world of rates. The Fed, the yield curve, inflation fears. How are they impacting options activity and volatility in your favorite interest rate products? Let's find out as we explore the world of rates. Mr. Rhodes' mouth is agape right now. He cannot handle the shock to his system. Me leading us down the path of rates. Usually it's Mr. Rhodes saying, let's talk about rates. (laughs) It's a good Russell Rhodes impersonation. You guys can follow all this action for yourselves, listeners. Head on over to the old report, seemegroup.com slash twifo, T-W-I-F-O, or slash twio, T-W-I-O. Go to the drop down there for U.S. rates. 
and you can begin your journey out there. You know, it's an interesting week. Like I mentioned, the big dog, Euro dollars, kind of dominating our list. And it's usually our kind of go-to in the rate spectrum for obvious reasons. It's the Leviathan in the options world over there at CME. Some weeks it'll do more paper than all the rest of the products we talk about combined. So it is still the big dog from an options volume perspective out there. But a lot of things going on out there in the world of rates this week. If you've been paying attention, you noticed uh, yields <laughs> moving a little bit to the dark side out there. Ten-year yields on track for the seventh straight session. That's the end of yesterday, actually. Uh, that's, of course, uh, so this is the longest streak we've seen out there on the ten-year since we saw a nine-session drop in yields. That was, of course, back in the heady days of March of last year. We all know what was going on in early March of last year. We, of course, had some data from the Labor Department this week on Wednesday saying job openings edging up a little bit in May, but hiring dipping, obviously not a good sign for the economy, still struggling with some shortages on the labor front, maybe sparking a little bit of underlying weakness out there. So a lot of interesting stuff going on in the world of rates. Mr. Rhodes, again, normally I toss it to you on rates and normally we start in the in the euro dollars, what do you say we start a little bit different this week and maybe go a little bit farther out in the curve? Let's say, dare I say it, perhaps the 30 year. What do you say to that, sir? Oh, okay. That's farther than I thought you were going to go, but I'm good with that. Yeah, it's down to pretty much yield on the 30 year. It's down, you know, another over six basis points uh, over the course of the middle of this week now. That's the lowest it's been since February of this year. So a lot of crazy stuff going on out here in the world of race. Mr. Rhodes, what is lighting your tape up this week in the mad, mad world of rates, sir? Well, we, we, you know, we're seeing lower rates across the board and the fed indicated it pretty much indicated that they weren't, they didn't think they'd do anything till 2023, I think, um, which will be the Michael Jordan year of the decade for all of us Chicagoans. But when you look at the FedWatch tool, which I think our friends at Quick Strike took over, uh, I don't recall seeing their their emblem on here before, and I'm kind of glad they did because it goes all the way out to 2023 now. Uh, it used to be they would only have like maybe the next year or so, and they've stretched it out farther. And uh, in the spring of 2022, uh, you're actually seeing the market start to price in a possibility of a of a hike, only about seven and a half percent. But when you get out to uh, the end of next year, you've got better than a 50 percent chance that we're going to have a uh, hike in rates, which is earlier than the Fed told us. And I love it when the market has a different opinion than the talking heads. Yeah, our friends over there, Quick Strike, they took it over, I think, a, a year or two ago. So they've been doing the Fed Watch for a little while out there. And you're right, I think it does make it a little bit more user friendly of an experience out there. Rates, not traditionally the most user-friendly of complexes, so we'll have to ease our listeners into it. A lot of people are looking at rates from different angles right now. I was looking at this uh, a chart from J.P. Morgan and Chase before the show here. They have a, what they call a fair value model for yields on U.S. Treasuries. They try to measure things like you know economic data, Fed expectations, all kinds of stuff, and come up with a term is a fair value model. They're saying the levels now on treasuries, they have deviated from that, again, going back to March of last year, the most since March of last year. So the 30-year looking crazy. We're seeing the a lot, of, a lot of levels and streaks we haven't seen since March of last year. So again, interesting stuff. Check out this fair value uh, chart for yourselves there, listeners. Uh, treasury yields nearly three standard deviations below what, at least Morgan thinks, is their fair value right now. So interesting things afoot out there in the world of rates. Again, we're going a little bit farther out on the curve just because you don't get a chance to hang our hat out there too often. 30 year and making number five on our list to the upside this week, up about two and a quarter percent. Coming into showtime, they're up about 1.83% net on the week since Monday. We're at about a 163.27 out there for those of you who don't follow the 30 year out there religiously in terms of action. And there is a decent amount of action. You might think 30 years, you know, how much does that really trade? But a lot. And 450,000 contracts on the tape as of a few minutes ago. So threatening half a million 
already. Of that, over half, 55.7% coming in the AUG contract here, which has, let's see, about 15 days to go. So you don't normally think of the weeklies on the 30-year, but that's exactly what was lighting it up out there this week. The vol out there, if you're wondering... (laughs) Longer-term treasury is not exactly known for robust levels of volatility. That said, we are looking a little bit juicier out here these days. Nearly a nine. You might say nine. My God, that's nothing. But in the land of treasuries where you're hovering around a six a lot of the times, if not less, an 8.91, almost a nine. It's pretty high. It's actually up about 1.4 points. That's a pretty big move in vol in the 30-year. In terms of skew out here, the puts last week, 3.8% cheap. This week, about a about almost a full point rich, so swung heavily in the other direction. The calls last week, 5.7% rich. This week, about half a percent. So the calls coming in, puts getting bid up, kind of what you traditionally see when you move up the skew there a little bit. In terms of where the action was this week, I said we're at a 163 and about a quarter. Coming into showtime, it was the 161 puts that were leading the dance out here in the AUG cycle here, doing 26,500 contracts this week. Again, a shortened holiday week, listeners. No action on Monday. So the big day was Wednesday, 14,600, more than half of that opening. About 4,000 on Tuesday, 8,000 so far hitting the tape today. So a lot of opening action on the 161 puts, followed by the 160 puts with about 17,300 on the tape out there so a lot of a lot of crazy stuff afoot out here let's look a little bit farther actually we don't see you know a lot of times with other products like metals and even some energy and others you see some interesting aberrant prints a little bit farther out not seeing that as much the craziest thing we have here on the tape this week in the 30 year looks like it's the sep 165s going up nearly fourteen thousand times the big day yesterday ten thousand two hundred uh, 2,400 on the tape today, about 1,000 on Tuesday. Again, most of that opening on Wednesday and Monday, or excuse me, Tuesday as well on the 165. So opening paper, the order of the day out here, even if it is not exactly perhaps as aberrant as you might think, but vol a little bit interesting out there. Mr. Rhodes, you know, 30-year, not exactly known for as, as a bastion of volatility trading, but you, you're closing in on a nine-point level here, up nearly one and a half points, a little bit more juice on the 30-year this week, sir. The, the thing with, you know, near term ball like that or near term ball expectations, uh, what's the uncertainty that's driving this, you know, um, and and are, are there things going in? And I'm, I'm going to I'm going to get into the academic weeds for just a second. And I'm, I'm teaching investment cl- banking for my last class to teach at Loyola before I move on to Indiana. And we just went through all of the 2008 stuff, but we went through it, uh, 2005, 2006, 2007, all the different things that, that kind of signaled that we had a problem on the horizon. And then today, I kind of wish this had happened the day before I had my lecture, but today, uh, Wells Fargo said that they're cutting off credit lines which means they are worried about giving people money that they may not get paid back on. Uh, this is something that we may look back on, um, you know, 18 months, two years down the road when we have our next true volatility event within the markets because uh, of a lot of different disconnects. And it, I just wonder if an announcement like that just fuels a little bit more fire for the um treasury area volatility i'll just try to say it's all encompassing with all the interest rate products Uh, because that nine number is it's it's huge uh the 10 year is what the old uh vix with interest rate vix was based on and we were used to like about a four to seven range if i remember correctly uh so nine is almost like i i would equate that for people that are more familiar with vix uh as vix running up to the 40s or 50s yeah, I had a similar thought there. That that's a pretty lofty level. Usually, I don't. Even, it is. I don't even bother quoting. You know, granted, that's in a weekly, so it's a much a gamma instrument as it is a vol product. Yeah. But still, yeah, I don't equate you know the thirty year with much beyond a six too often out there. So that that's an impressive level of vol. Again, if you maybe you're not attracted by the equity levels of vol, and there is more of that to talk about a little bit later today as well. If that hasn't lured you to the dark side, then perhaps the rates getting a little bit juicier out there 
will lure you. We can't we can't talk rates without talking about the big dog out here. Let's go back out to Euro dollars. Go back to that drop down listeners and go jump up to the Euro dollars. You'll see it is the big boy in the pool. Even if it is looking a little light this week, only about two and a half million contracts. Again, we did have a truncated holiday week, so no trading on Monday. That's obviously playing into this here. Uh, but still, usually this time of the show, usually about active week, you're talking four plus million contracts out here. So a little bit light out there this week of that volume, that lighter volume seems like it's so funny because it's so evenly split in Euro dollars. It really isn't. It's not like the ags. You get 35, 45, 50 percent of the paper in one month. You know, the most you're going to get like this week, <laughs> we're going out to DC of this year. And it's a uh, 14% of the paper has lined up in there. So it's very evenly spread out product, which also makes it sometimes a little bit intimidating to some of the newcomers out there. If we go out to these contracts there, they have like 155 days to go. We're talking about a little bit over 99 and a half out there in the levels out there in that future listeners. And vol wise, a little bit different story than we're seeing in the 30 year where we get all excited about a nine talking about a 37. So over four X that even though that has come in four and a half points this week. So ball actually coming in this week out here in the Euro dollars, which is kind of interesting. Skew wise here in this Dece contract, 25 points. That was the premium on the puts. These puts were bid to high heaven out here. 25 point premium last week, this week, 21 points. So it's still fairly rich. The calls last week, nobody wanted to touch them. 23.6% cheap last week, this week, 21% cheap. So getting a little bit of that juice back, but not much. So wow, this is a this is an equity skew and then some out here in this month in the Euro dollars. No one wants calls and they're bidding up all the puts. Let's see what was trading out here this week. Surprise, surprise, it was the 99 and a half puts leading the dance out here this week with a whopping 116,000 contracts. That's just in three days, listeners. So that's pretty impressive. Today's leading the cake. With 59,000, almost just a tick under 60,000 for today, leading the dance out there in the 99 and a half puts listeners. Yesterday, 13,500. Monday, 43,000, about 500 out there. Again, it's kind of back and forth both of these days in terms of opening versus closing, but a lot of just a ton of paper on the tape out here in the old Euro dollars. Mr. Rhodes. Anything catching your fancy in the just tsunami of paper that is the euro dollar, sir? Well, you do see, um, and of course, my screen just flipped over, so now I'm going to lose the numbers. But you do see some pretty big numbers going out through the end of the year as far as volatility expectations go for the euro dollars relative to what you normally see. So say kind of, kind of the same thing that we saw on the very long end with the 30-year uh, and near-dated options on the 30-year uh, but I think we're, you know, it, it, as much as everything is being talked down and, and you know, pulling a Kevin Bacon from Animal House, nothing to see here, remain calm. Uh, that's not what the option market, at least in the interest rate complex, is signaling for the second half of this year at all. Indeed. We can probably talk rates for the rest of the show, but there are probably some other complexes. We should set our eyes on as well. So where should we take our journey next, sir? Food. Let's go to the ag. Foods. So you want to go all lean yeah. hogs? You want to get some pigs on the show, sir? <laughs> I want to start with corn. <laughs> all right. Ags it is. Here we go, listeners. It's time to get our hands dirty exploring the latest options, trades, and trends in corn, wheat, soybeans, and more. It's time to talk ags. All right, everybody. Let's get our hands dirty. Like the man said, talking some ags, you guys know where to go. Go to that drop down over there, move it up to agriculture, then head into grains and oil seeds. And we're going to choose corn from that drop down. First, I like to hit select all after that so I could see all of the things that are lighting it up this week. But again, if you're kind of just just getting started, probably keep things a little bit more manageable out there. 313,000 contracts on the tape for corn. Again, a light week, but again, a truncated holiday week as well. We probably would be closer to half a million out here if we had some paper going up on Monday out there. Mr. Rhodes, what is catching your eye in the land of corn and or food this week, sir? Well, it just, you know, we had, we had it, a nice rally in several of them last week, and we've had a nice drop off this week. So, you know, it, the debate has always been uh, one of the big 
if I were making a list of things to be to be concerned about into the second half of this year, uh, if I had written it at the beginning of June, I probably would have put inflation way up there. Um, now I I actually think I would move inflation down a little bit. But being, uh, you know, being a little bit of an economist, I would say inflation or deflation, because it is very possible that uh, after we get this reopening spike in prices and the supply chain in a lot of different areas catches up, that we might see too much supply for demand and may see that in a slowing economy. And we could actually experience deflation. deflation. And, you know, one week we get a rise in the, the ag futures. They were all at the top, all on the light side of the list. Uh, this week, they're all down an awful lot. And the one thing that hasn't changed very much is the at the money implied volatility for options on corn. Uh, they, it's down slightly, but really only down by like a point or so from from where it was at the end of last week. So the, the price is zigzagging uh, and the implied volatility is not coming down. If we, you know, if we saw a, a drop off in corn and we saw implied volatility come down a little bit, my, my attitude would be, OK, we've, we've adjusted to a level that everybody's more comfortable with. But we've adjust, we adjusted and everybody main, remains as risk sensitive or as uncomfortable uh, with corn and pretty much all the other ags that were at the top of the dark side list. So uh, implied volatility remaining pretty darn elevated, uh, which leads me to think that we haven't found the price for our, you know, September or November corn quite yet does appear to be the case corn number one on our dark side list this week listeners off 10.11 percent since our last show off about nine and a half percent since Monday of this week so obviously the lion's share of that sell-off coming this week we had about a 536 on that front futures down 56 points so far this week so a bit of a drubbing out there in corn land looks like most of the action was in the Dece contract this week, about 42%. Like I said, a very different beast than what we see in Euro dollars, where it's spread very evenly across many months and strikes. In this case of the AGs, it's usually aggregated around a couple of contracts and months. In this case, it's the Dece contract, 42% of the paper out here. Again, that Dece future, we're at about 522, so a little bit lower, a little bit farther out the curve there. In terms of where the vol is right now, 3560, that's off about four, about 4.6 or so points, almost five points from where it was this time last week. So still frothy, still more elevated than your random equity out there. <laughs> so a little bit more juice still to be found in the ags, even though some of that ball has come off this week. In terms of skew, a little bit of move on the call side, not as much on the puts. The puts were 6.3% cheap last week, about 6.5% cheap this week. So not a huge move from the downside perspective. Calls, though. Nearly 8% rich last week, 1.6% rich this week. So calls have come in tremendously as the puts have remained relatively firm out there. In terms of what was lighting up the tape, what was the number one hot option out here in corn land this week? Well, if you wanted to say maybe a five quarter or maybe a 500 as we're threatening the dark side there, you would be wrong. It's actually the 600 calls leading the dance this week with 15,200. The big day yesterday, about 10,500, about 4,200 on Tuesday. Not a lot hitting the tape today. And most of that seems like it's pretty much back and forth, slightly ever so mildly biased towards closing listeners. Not a heck of a lot of bias in one direction, really. So a lot of back and forth on the 600s yesterday and on Tuesday. And also followed right behind that were the 700s. So interesting paper, you know, or total volume wise, it lines up like one by two. But if you look at it day by day, it doesn't. 5,300 went up on Tuesday, about 3,000 on Wednesday, about 500 today, slightly biased towards closing throughout the week. So some people have given up the ghost on the 700 strike out there in corn this week followed hot on its heels by the something. This is more along the lines of what I expected. The 540 puts out there doing nearly 6,000 contracts yesterday, about 2,300 on Tuesday, and a whopping three today for a total of about 8,000, most of that opening. So opening downside, that's kind of what I expected out here. Let's see any other crazy prints lighting it up out here. 600's also active 
here in August, going out in about 15 days, nearly 6,000 of those going up. So 600 strike. Interesting. That's not the strike I expected to be dominating the action out here in all things corn, especially when we're plunging to the dark side. But not the case this week. 600s are where the action was. Mr. Rhodes, where else should we hang our hat in ag, sir? Well, just one one quick, I promise I'll be quick. Um, just one quick thing on, I was looking week over week while you were talking with um, with the, the corn options. And you did mention that, you know, the, the implied volatility of the calls has come in an awful lot. Uh, there's actually more call volume this week than last week relative to put volume, which is not exactly what you would expect when the market's dropping. But you you, you answered the, the question that was in the back of my mind while you were talking when you said that it looks like it's the, on the call side, it's a lot of closing, which, uh, you know, that, that would make sense, pushing the relative implied volatility of the calls down, but also doing so uh, at elevated relative volume. So maybe maybe there is something to read into what's going on right now. Um, even though the implied volatility is hanging up there somewhat, uh, it's shifting from the call side to the put side. And we're shifting over to the wheat side of the fence. We don't really get a chance to talk a ton of wheat here on the show. But number three, dark side mover was KC wheat. Number four was our good old friend SRW wheat, obviously the more active of the two. So we're going to hang our hat. Out there, it was off 6.15% since our last show, and of course, off about five and a quarter percent so far this week. At about a 618 and three quarters out there is where we find ourselves coming into showtime. About 44,000 contracts on the tape. So, again, not as active as a corn and also a truncated week, but one of the more active once you get beyond corn, like second or third most active out there. You throw the beans into that mix usually as well. Uh, be, excuse me, wheat doing. Decent paper, like I said this week, about 44,000 contracts uh, on this truncated holiday week. In terms of where the action was, once again, it is concentrated in one month. This time it is in September, 43% of the paper going up out here. The vol at about a 32 in the wheat, so not that dissimilar to what we're seeing out there in corn. Actually up ever so slightly this week, about a third of a point. In terms of skew last week, the puts 5.6% cheap. This week, 6.1% cheap. It's getting a little bit cheaper this week while the calls kind of unched. 7.9% rich last week, 7.7% rich this week. So not quite the same move in the call wing that we saw in corn going on out here in wheat this week. And in terms of the most active contract, the number one hot product, hot trade out here in wheat was actually here in August. It was the August 660s going up 3,000 times that was the most active contract this week. Almost all of that on Wednesday. The 690s also traded. It looks like maybe some funky verticals going up on Wednesday. Most of the action this week was on Wednesday. Not a lot lighting it up today or even on Tuesday out here. So some weird stuff afoot here. 690s going up 2,000 times as well. In terms of the SEP contract, that's the most active contract in month this, this week. 630 puts where the action was out there, trading about a thousand times on Tuesday and about a little over a thousand on Wednesday, a whopping zero today here. So a little bit of back and forth on that strike as we have blown through it now here in the weeds. Let's look really quickly. You don't see a lot of that kind of aberrant paper that you see in the metals or the energy products in the ags, and we're not seeing that this week in the old KC wheat either. Soybean meals number two. On our chart, but not doing a heck of a lot of paper this week. You know, only about looks like thirteen thousand contracts on the tape, so not a lot to hang our hat on there. And rough rice, obviously, not a huge options player either. So instead, let's go out to another space, Mister Rhodes, that I know you are very familiar with, and just barely missed out on our bottom five. Came in at number six this week. It's the Russell two thousand. It's time to talk some equities. It's time to explore the volatility swings, skew changes, and hot options trades in your favorite indices. It's time to talk equities. All right, let's get to it, listeners. Let's talk some equities. Now, you can't really explore the world of equities without looking at the flip side of that coin, which is volatility. And come into showtime, we had a little bit more of it on the screen than we did this time last week. Let's start in RBX land. Obviously, the VIX of the Russell 2000s at about 26 and a half when we kicked off the show puts it up a little over four about 4.6 points 
from where it was this time last week. So for a while there, the narrative has been, can RVX break 20 this time? Nope. Racing back up closer to the 30 handle now than to the 20 handle. VIX Cash coming in to start the show is at about 18 and a half. That puts it up about exactly three points from where it was this time last week. And VVIX, the vol of vol, was close to a 120, about a 119, up about 11 and a half points from last week. And, of course, vol Q, a.k.a. the at the money vol of the NASDAQ 100, at about a 1930, puts it up about two and three quarters points from what it was this time last show. So that means that VIX to RBX spread, a.k.a. the large cap to small cap vol spread, almost exactly eight points. That's wider than we've seen it in a while. It's about 1.6 points wider than it was this time last week, as again, a lot of that probably due to that that just juice that's flying in to RBX there and the VIX to ball Q. So the S&P 500 to the NASDAQ ball spread getting tighter, less than a point now. It's about 0.85. That's about a third of a point tighter than last week. Again, kind of reflecting there's a lot of similarities going on between the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ these days. Mr. Rhodes, obviously, we call you the once in future Dr. Vic, so you hang your hat out there in the world of volatility. A little bit more of it on the screen this week than there was last week. What's lighting up your tape in the world of volatility and indeed equity, sir? Well, one thing to keep in, keep in mind is um, as far as VOLQ versus VIX goes, um, VOLQ will probably start to widen out relative to VIX over the next two to three weeks as we come upon uh, July earnings season, which I feel like is the earnings season gets the least amount of love. Um, but because you have a handful of the really big uh, NASDAQ components reporting in the last week of July, you most definitely will see elevated VOLQ versus VIX. Don't let it uh, don't let it worry you when you hear that it's widened out the past couple of weeks. And um, that small cap to VIX thing. Oh, my. I mean, when when is that going to narrow? It doesn't narrow when Russell outperforms. It doesn't narrow when it underperforms. It just, uh, you know, maybe they're just more users of Russell 2000 calls uh, speculating for an upside move than there are in the S&P 500 arena. Because uh, uh, even bullish moves in RVX seem to uh, hold that index up, not as much as it was in the first quarter of this year, but still, um, I guess more expectations around uh, domestic U.S. stocks, uh, or more expected volatility around domestic U.S. stocks throughout the end of this year and showing up in the expected volatility. Let's see what's shown up in them, their options. By the way, it's interesting research, crunching the numbers out of FTSE Russell. You guys can find this for yourselves. FTSE Russell, F-T-S-E Russell.com is the place to go. And they're looking at, you know, because the narrative for a long time has been Russell 2000. Russell 2000 is what we talk about here on the show quite a bit. And ever since the election of last year, it really kicked into high gear. It got, became a favorite of the meme kids out there for a while. It was blowing the doors off, especially through Q1 of this year. Ever since... End of Q1, kind of mid-March, uh, it seems like Russell 1000 has been getting some ground back on the little kids, on the Russell 2000 out there. And by the end of the end of the quarter, it had pretty much drawn even with the Russell 2000 in terms of the, the performance gap that had, uh, had been just outpacing the Russell 1000 for a while. So the narrative beginning of the year was small caps. The narrative now heading into the... End of the first half of the year, it seems like the big dogs may be taking some of that steam back. Will that continue or will we see uh, the little dogs out there, the Russell 2000 lighting it up again? Let's go out there right now and find it for ourselves. You can find this. Go to equities listeners in the drop down equity indexes to be precise. Then go to U.S. index in parentheses E mini. Then drop down to the Russell 2000. You'll see the action out there this week at a 22, 27 Coming into showtime off three and a quarter percent this week, 75 handles. That's a, a rough week for small caps out there in terms of where the action was. Once again, it's in the freaking weeklies that are going out tomorrow, <laughs> 30% almost, 29% of the paper was in those weeklies. And then 21% was in the contract that goes out in eight days. That's just the, the equity story, listeners. If you're not looking at the weeklies in the equities, you're missing a huge part of the picture. So unfortunately, it's hard for us to parse that from a vol and from a skew perspective because those numbers are kind of meaningless with one day to go. So we'll, we'll split the difference. How about we'll split the uprights? We'll go out eight days. <laughs> it's still within our, our bar of comfort there, but we'll do it. 
because that's kind of where the action is. The vol, if you're wondering, and again, I use that term in air quotes, at about a 25 on that uh, eight-day-to-go contract in the Russell 2000, up a whopping eight points. Skew-wise, the puts last week, 12.3% rich. This week, 9% rich. The calls, 9.6% cheap. This week, 9.9% cheap. So not a huge move on the calls, but a decent bit of juice uh, coming out of the puts there. Again, we kind of broke through a lot of those strikes, so some of that makes a fair amount of sense. In terms of the most active contract out here this week, though, it was the 2400s, which, again, Russell, this has kind of been a, a narrative people have fixated on for a while here in the Russell 2000, what they call what Matt, I believe, referred to on the show as the small delta calls, where these are literally very small delta. Now the 2400s are going out tomorrow, and a whole bunch of them trading yesterday. Uh, and not, not a lot going up Wednesday or today, but a whole bunch going up on Tuesday. So I guess, Mr. Rhodes, it is fair to say that the small delta calls are back in action here in the Russell 2000, sir. Do you concur? I, I concur looking at the volume. Do, you, do we know if it's uh, the paper buying or the paper selling or not 100% sure? It's just closing. That's all we can see here. So people were oh, taking, okay. taking some of those off. So I'm going to maybe guess that they were, uh, they were holding on to those bad boys. Those are kind of, you know, that's a little bit of the old hopium trade out there, the 2400s. That's the traditional use case we've seen from them in small caps. Not a lot of selling on those. It's mostly buying. And someone came in and closed out a bunch of them on Tuesday. So I'm guessing they thought the jig was up. 2400 not going to happen this week, sir, and uh, tried to get what they could that was left for him, Mr. Rhodes. You know, I, I've been doing some work on what I like to refer to as the lottery ticket trade, which is is if you were purchasing you know, those calls, that, that's exactly what you were doing. Um, I found out if you're consistently you know, buying a five delta option on one of the big equity index, uh, indexes, uh, you're twice as likely to make the money on the call side than the put side. I guess the meme kids will be happy to hear that because they've been doing nothing but loading yeah. up on calls <laughs> of late. I know Who you, knew? Wouldn't, you wouldn't and you wouldn't guess that, but it was actually like twenty percent of the of it, it was like twenty percent of the time you could make money on a one standard deviation call option. Only about nine percent of the time do you make money on a one standard deviation put option, and that's just buying it outright. And of course, the puts are going to be a little bit juicier, so that's going to probably right. play, play into right. some of that calculation a wee bit. You're paying a heck of a lot more for that put, so you need more bang for your buck for it to pay off. The calls, historically, in equities, listeners, fairly cheap, so at least cheaper than the puts. So probably why that is playing out that way, but interesting stuff nonetheless. Maybe a little bit of encouragement for all the folks out there who are flocking into them their small delta calls, as the kids like to call. I'm just looking really quickly if I see any other aberrant Weird prints. Let's do it really quickly since we're hanging out in equities and they have been moving quite a bit. Let's go out to the big dog as well. Let's go to the E mini S and P five hundred. Yeah, I know a lot of you folks like to sling it out there. Let's see how much paper is on the tape out there, listeners. And let's see, going into ooh about one point three million contracts on the tape this week. So not a bad week here for ye old E mini. Take a guess where nearly 30% of that is aggregated, listeners. If you said the contract going out in one day, you've been paying attention. <laughs> and about 20.5% going out in eight days. So this is, again, this is the cycle of equities. No one wants to touch anything that's beyond two weeks. <laughs> so we shall once again make a concession. Let's go out a whopping eight days. The contract expiring then, where about 21% of the paper went up this week. A 4308 is where we are at this point in the show here in the S&P 500 here. That's off about 34 and a half handles, about three quarters of a percent. So much less of a drawdown than we saw out there in the small caps. In terms of vol, we're talking about almost a 14, 1385, up nearly five points. Again, this is a weekly, so take some of that number with a grain of salt. Skew, same deal. 22.9% rich were the puts last week, 23% rich this week. So the puts still bit up. Calls 14.5% cheap last week, this week 10.8% cheap. So calls are getting a little bit of their juice back, which is kind of interesting. Maybe some folks read Russell's research and decided they wanted to gobble up on some index calls. But, you know, the big dog this week, listeners, in terms of action, it was in the 42 half puts. So a strike we have not broken, at least maybe we did this morning, but have not broken as of right now. 
Uh, 26,700 of these on the tape this week. The big day today, 13,000, about 500. The rest kind of evenly scattered throughout the week, followed by the 4,300 puts, a strike we're pretty much hovering at right now, about 20,500, 8,400 on the tape today, 7,100 yesterday, about 5,000 on Tuesday. So near-term puts (laughs) going out in a day, that's kind of about what I expected, and that's pretty much what we got. If you go a little bit farther out, we go to the to eight days, a whopping eight days. It's the 3,600 puts that were the big dog, going up nearly 20,000 times, about 19,000 on Wednesday. Haven't traded the rest of the week. I traded a one lot on Tuesday. That's it. Other than that, nothing else trading. But 18,660, all of that opening going up on Wednesday, and the 3,600 puts going out in eight days. Interesting. <laughs> Not exactly... You can't really call that a hedge. If we hit 3,600 by next, by next week, that'd be some interesting stuff afoot out there in the world of equities, and these vol numbers would have to be a lot higher to make that happen. Mr. Rose, anything catching your eye in the world of the S&P? And I also noticed a little nugget. You said your research there on the call-out performance tends to work the best in the NASDAQ, sir. It does tend to work in the best in the NASDAQ, and that may have something to do with just how much the NASDAQ's rallied over the last uh, five years, which was the time frame that I, I looked at it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to definitely expand that to the Russell and the S&P 500 as well. What I, you know, you do the, you're, you're here every week. I'm here uh, every other week or so. And it just seems to me with everything that we've gone through so far that we're highlighting a, a lot of nervousness. And typically, you know, the, the week after the 4th of July is not when we start getting nervous about the markets. It's usually in August but it, it, whether it's focusing on near-term options because you have no idea in the equity markets what's going to happen beyond a couple of weeks um, or, you know, thinking that we're going to get excess interest rate volatility toward the end of this year, it, it just it, it, being very close to the markets, it, it just feels like there's extra nervousness out there. I don't know if you're getting the same sense or not. Well, we are seeing vol ticking up kind of across the board for a lot of the products out there. We are seeing interesting strikes. I mean, those 3,600s are certainly interesting in the S&P. But outside of that, you're right. And then, well, of course, some some areas it's merited, like the ags or they're getting hit pretty hard. We're seeing, you know, that interesting stuff going on in the yields that is perhaps indicating some skittishness afoot. So you're right. I guess across the board, if you wanted to pick a theme for the action this week, it could be nervousness, skittishness, if you will. You know who aren't nervous and aren't skittish and certainly aren't hesitant? It's our listeners. So let's get to them. A little bit of their futures options feedback it's time for your questions comments and insights it's time for futures options feedback submit your questions at twitter.com slash options facebook.com slash the options insider stocktwits.com slash options insider or via questions at the options insider.com You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider Radio Network mobile app, available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everybody. Let's see how many of you we could squeeze on the program here. First up, we got Audi. I wonder what he drives. <laughs> Audi wants to know, uh, do you think rut options offer more bang for the buck for volatility traders right now versus S&P 500 or NASDAQ options? That's an interesting, highly subjective question. I guess it depends what you mean by bang for the buck, Audi, because right now you are getting a lot more vol <laughs> for the Russell 2000. You're talking a 24 and a half on these contracts we were just highlighting versus a 12 or 13 in terms of vol in the S&P 500, the E-mini out there. So you are quite literally getting a lot more vol (laughs) on these contracts. It's also moving a lot more. We're off, we said, about three quarters of a percent on the S&P 500 versus three and a half percent this week. So it's more vol is costing you more, but you're also getting a lot of movement out there in the Russell 2000 to make up for it so it's an interesting question mr rhodes a highly subjective one what are your thoughts 
on uh, on rut options are they giving you more bang for the buck than s p or nasdaq sir um i actually let, let I, i'm gonna turn it around in a little bit but but answer the question uh instead of saying bang for the buck let's say if you had to buy an at the money straddle right now uh, would you do it on the NASDAQ, the S&P 500 or the Russell? And, and I'm going to go, I'm going to say the options expire on the last day of July. I would lean toward the NASDAQ, even though they're a little bit more expensive than, than the S&P 500 today. But I feel like that is the area that could be the most impacted if we get another round of inflation fears. Uh, or even if if suddenly people start to buy into the deflation story that I've heard come up uh, a couple of times, uh, plus you have that that earnings influence that I don't think is being priced. I know is not being priced into Nasdaq options quite yet. So if I were looking for juice from the buying side, I would definitely be looking at buying NDX options. Uh, if I had to be neutral over the course of the month, I'd probably lean toward the uh, the Russell options just because they remain ridiculously overpriced relative. I shouldn't say ridiculously, but well overpriced relative to um, history when you compare it to VIX. All right, Mr. Rhodes, we got one here just for you. A listeners must like you. This is MTB. He or she wants to know, where does Russell see the action in the futures market right now? I'm mostly an equity options trader. And they put in parentheses, spy, Apple, a little AMC and Facebook. So you like everybody out there, <laughs> MTB. It says, and I trade a lot of verticals, flies, and covered calls. Where do you think I should be looking to trade some futures options? Mr. Rhodes, this is kind of a, a variation on a question we get a lot, which is, you know, someone's coming from the world of equity options. They want to dip their toes and then their futures options, where do you think he should begin, sir? I, you, you know, it's not a market that, it, it, it's not a new market for you, but uh, I, I found out a couple of weeks ago while I was on this program that the options on the, I believe it's the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ micro um, futures, uh, the volume is just out of control. Um, so there's probably some great liquidity in there. And, and so if you're thinking about something related to either of those markets, uh, that that's where I would steer you. Uh, what I like as far as the, the first step beyond equities, uh, I kind of like the energy markets. I, we didn't talk about oil today, but they're getting ready to launch a smaller future on WTI, I think maybe early next week, and options will not be fa- you know won't won't be too far behind. It's volatile enough that you you know you, it, I think it's an implied volatility level that you'd be comfortable with if you're coming from the equity space. We talked about interest rates and how what's considered high implied volatility in interest rate. Uh, options is not the same as equities, whereas in the energy space, they're they're comparable number-wise. But also, you'll have um, what happens in oil have a direct impact on equities sometimes. So from a macro standpoint, I think you've got some fundamentals that drive both markets periodically. So I, I would say move over to oil, maybe move over to the metals. But those are the two markets if you're going to expand beyond equities that I would that, that I would encourage um, you to consider just because I think the behavior of them is closest to equities. Yeah, I can get behind that. I've, I've often said, obviously, they should start in equities because that's what they're familiar with. So start in the equity indices. It, it won't be that dissimilar to what you're used to trading now. Then when you want to expand beyond it, I've said many times, I think WTI is a good stopping ground for a lot of you. You watch it. You pay attention to it. You're interested in it. The skew is not that dissimilar from what we're seeing out there in the broad indices. So it won't be that surprising. You know, the calls are generally offered, puts are generally bid. So that won't be something that will come as a shock to you out there. So it's, that's a decent next level trade. Once you, if you decide you're tired of equities for whatever reason, want to branch out a little bit, certainly a lot more palatable and easier to understand than let's say, Something that trades by appointment like lean hogs <laughs> or something like that. Uh, you mentioned energy and the new contract here. Let's jump to this one then from Mike. Mike says, when do you expect the newer, smaller WTI contracts to trade? Well, if all goes as planned, Mike and everybody else out there, the CME plans to launch these micro WTI futures, which again, if you, you missed the announcement, we talked about them a few times on the show. There's going to be one-tenth the size 
of the standard WTI contract. So this is kind of following the pattern we've seen work out pretty well for the folks at CME. Everything micro is trading up a storm, micro futures on the equities, now the options on the micro futures. So they're just following suit and bringing out a micro WTI. Uh, These are expected to launch next week, July 12th. So hopefully if all goes well, this is of course pending regulatory approval, but if all that regulatory stuff goes as planned, this time next week, we will have a new micro WTI contract to parse. Mr. Rhodes, does that intrigue you, sir? It intrigues me. And and when they get the volume in the micro futures, I do think options will be um, soon to follow. And launching options on futures regulatory-wise is a lot easier than coming up with a new index option, uh, whereas the options on futures are practically covered in the filing when you when you uh, file to launch a new futures contract. Uh, so keep a close eye on that. One last thing I did want to say, uh, I'm backtracking on you, I apologize, but one of the cool things about gold and oil as well is there are volatility indexes on those. So, you know, if you're trading S&P 500, uh, you should be watching, um, you know, VIX, RVX for the Russell 2000, et cetera. There are volatility indexes on oil and gold that are, that you can, uh, that maybe will help you get comfortable with the volatility behavior and the options in those markets. Well said, sir. Unfortunately, that music means we've come to the end of our sojourn through the world of futures options. Is there a product you like to trade? We didn't get a chance to parse on the show. Hit us up. If it's interesting and does some paper, we might want to squeeze it onto the show. Of course, you have questions or comments, you know where to find us at options. Most of the major social media platforms are pro and our plus folks get bumped to the top of the list. If you have a question, you want to sign up there, your members hotline will get you bumped right up to the top of the list. And before we go, Mr. Rhodes, are you working on anything intriguing that you think will fascinate our audience out there? Have at it, sir. Uh, any day now, something should come out about how to go about trading the um, Russell 2000 and the various options on that market. Uh, just waiting for one last little compliance sign off. And when that comes out, uh, definitely tweet the tweet the link of where you can go find that. So that's probably the main thing. Uh that I'm publicly working on. Privately, I I want you to start having to call me Dr. Vix and we're getting close. You will always be the once and future doctor, even even when you have that paper in your hot little hands. It is too late, sir. The moniker is solidified now in the brains and ear holes of our listeners. You know where to go to find all that other research we're just talking about on all things footsie Russells. If you're intrigued, by all these things we talked about here on the show earlier, you want to check them out in between episodes of TWIFO. FTSE Russell, F-T-S-E Russell.com is the place to go. They have all this data on Russell 1000 versus 2000, the volatility, impact of the pandemic, recon, the use of derivatives in and around those things, all sorts of fun stuff. FTSE Russell.com is the place to go. Give them a follow while you're at it at FTSE Russell, F-T-S-E Russell on Twitter as well. And of course, you know where to go. For all these reports we talk about throughout the show, they're not just live during showtime. They're live all week long. So if you want to go check Lean Hogs at 2 a.m. on a Saturday, no one will judge you, except maybe your wife or significant other. We won't know, so have at it (laughs) and enjoy it. CMEgroup.com slash Twifo or slash Twio is the place to go to kick the tires and light the fires. On behalf of everybody over there at CME and at FTSE Russell Land and Mr. Rhodes, the once and future Dr. Vicks, and indeed myself. I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for listening live, for joining us on the Pro and the Plus, for sending in those questions. We'd love to hear from all of you out there. We'll be back again tomorrow, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern for volatility views. And then 2 p.m., of course, the new time out there for options oddities. Back again next week, kicking it all off on Monday with the option block all the way through to Thursday. Another episode of This Week in Futures Options.
This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME group. For more information, please visit ftserussell.com, cboe.com, and cmegroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs> 